Millions of new businesses are created each year and several hundred thousand fail each year. So what happened and could it have been stopped? I'm Ivana Taylor. I'm the publisher of DIY Marketers and the host of Bizapalooza Chat. And today we're going to show you how to turn your struggling business around. Our guest today is Walt Jones, a strategy consultant with SEQ Advisory Group, where he helps businesses increase profits and improve their internal operations and hopefully turn that struggle around. So let me introduce you to our guest today and Bizapalooza community member, Walt Jones. Welcome, Walt. Hi, Ivana. How are you today? I am so happy to meet you. I love it when I meet our community members and especially when they are small business owners themselves. Talk a little bit about how you got involved in the turnaround business. And then we'll talk about what a turnaround maybe is so that people can understand. Uh, sure. So my, uh, my background uh, by trade uh, is in uh, financials and project management. So I spent about uh, two and a half years working for J.P. Morgan as a, a senior business analyst working on conversion projects uh, related to large bank mergers. Uh, from there, I spent about three years at TiVo Price working primarily in uh, financial analysis. And I was kind of at a point in my career, I was looking, still trying to figure out, I guess, what I wanted to do when I grew up. And uh, I got an opportunity to work for a nonprofit organization uh, as a project manager. It was one I was volunteering with. And so when I got into the, the organization, they were fairly small, but very large in terms of volunteer driven. And one of the things that they were impressed with was my process improvement background um, at the uh, financial organization that I work for. And as they were moving, to, moving towards um, their 20th anniversary, they were looking towards the future and were trying to figure out how to uh, really revolve. And so my job in there was to manage a couple of large projects they had, but also to look for areas to improve some of their internal processes and the operations. So that was like my first real taste of it. And I really liked it. I just, I like the, you know, solving the problems that initially have no answer. And from there, uh, I got into consulting with a, uh, a consulting firm based in the DC area, uh, and then ultimately into my own firm. So let's talk a little bit about turnarounds. You know, you and I had a conversation. I have a little bit of a turnaround experience. You do turnarounds for a living. But I think a lot of small business owners, you know, they feel the struggle. I hear it every day, but they don't understand what a turnaround is exactly. Can you kind of explain that for folks? Sure. So the idea behind turnaround is uh, think of it really in a sense of a 180. It's really uh, fixing fixing a business situation uh, it could be a collection of problems that a company's currently having. Uh, some can be more devastating where a company is uh, has lost clients, has lost revenue, is you know, on the brink of shutting their doors. Other instances may not be so um, so critical where it's maybe a certain division is um, product you know, productivity is down. Uh, maybe they have lost uh, a major client or they're really looking to kind of step into um, to really take the next step to really expand the business. So turnaround can look, can have a number of different looks. Uh, but in most cases, a lot of time it's often associated with, with businesses that are uh, severely troubled or struggling. Hmm. So what are some common signals that a business owner would see that tells them that, wow, I need a turnaround situation because oftentimes they wait too long. Um, well, first, the very most important thing is they have to be willing to admit there's a problem. Uh, and you would be surprised that actually often is a fairly big hurdle. Uh, some of the different signs that I've seen from uh, clients that I've worked with and engagers that I've been on is uh, things like declining margins. So whether it's uh, we're talking operating or even net margins, uh, where maybe over a period of time they've kind of declined. However, decline with no changes in, let's say, economic or external factors. So where it seems almost out of nowhere, we're just not making as much money than, uh, that we previously were. 
another thing is a uh, uh, inability to meet uh, vendor payments or obligations. So where now we're finding it difficult to uh, pay our bills. Uh, basically, you know, a lot of times, you know, that basically there's an issue with uh, cash flow. So that's that's a, actually usually a huge red flag. Um, and a lot of times I've had instances where, you know, whether it's uh, you know, an accountant I've worked with or maybe business bankers or, you know, in conversations and they often say, you know, okay, well, you know, I'm working with a client now who I noticed that they're having issues. Like, you know, they haven't been paying their invoices or they haven't paid me yet. And tax season ended almost two months ago now. Um, so those, those are uh, some common um, issues there. So also another area is where uh, maybe orders from customers are either getting shorter or they're less. So maybe your customers aren't ordering as much. So that kind of signals that maybe uh, they feel like you're not actually able to meet the, um, let's say the order, the quantities that you were once making in a timely fashion. So those are all kind of like some early warning signs that you may want to look at, or at least consider like, hey, there's a problem we need to maybe take a look into. Well, that of course prompts the next question, which is if you want your business to stay healthy, what are some like of the top three metrics that a business owner should be looking at regularly and how regularly should they be looking at those? Uh, cash flow. Cash flow, cash is king. Cash flow is very important. Uh, just a, uh, I guess a, a quick story. Um, I remember reading about a, a company in the, um, in the Baltimore DC region, probably about one or two years ago. And I've used it as a, a case study for, um, my, uh, business class that I teach at our local community college. And it basically was a situation where a company was generating probably about $10 million in revenue annually. Uh, they were profitable. They were doing fairly well. However, the type of business they were in required uh, a large amount of cash outlay in the early stages where they would then recoup it on the back end. And basically, they just had poor cash flow. Ultimately, they were uh, they had lines of credit and loans they had taken out, uh, but they were not meeting their interest payments. And long and short of it, the uh, one of their largest creditors got a court order and seized their operations account. And essentially, they were closed overnight. Uh, so that, you know, that's one of the ways to show that, you know, cash flow is, it's critical. You know, you have to be able to meet your obligations. You have to be able to, uh, pay your employees. You have to be able to operate the business on an ongoing basis until, you know, revenue and money starts coming in and on the type of business. So that's definitely one metric there. Um, another metric, uh, I typically like to look at, uh, also, just looking at your uh, EBITDA, uh, E-B-I-T-D-A, it's uh, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. And that also kind of gives you, basically, it looks at what does it actually cost to run the business. So it looks kind of, it's not quite um, to the point of operating profit uh, that we factor for EBITDA, we factor out um, depreciation and amortization, but it really gives a great indicator of what your business is actually costing and how much you're actually making from there. So kind of give you a baseline look at what some of your, uh, your profit is from that standpoint. All right, Mr. Smarty Pants. I got to ask you this because I don't remember, mm -hmm. and I'm sure many of our audiences don't know, because I don't know if, you know, if you're reviewing your income statements and your cash flows and all mm -hmm. that for small business owners as mm -hmm. often as they should be. We used to have monthly meetings, but hey. Mm -hmm. Where is this EBIT dot number found? So that that's going to be uh, on your income statement. So when you think about your operating profit, which is essentially going to be your uh, your revenue minus um, any basically operational expenses. So whether it's fixed or variable, so whether it's your your costs, or as we say, your cost of goods sold. So basically the um, the cost of the items you're actually producing or the service you're providing. Uh, utilities, rent, depreciation. So after you've covered all of those items, you know, then you have your profit there. So just above that, um, before we factor out the, uh, the depreciation amortization, that's going to be that's going to be your EBITDA. So it essentially has to be calculated, uh, but it's a great indicator to uh, to really tell you know what your business is doing. But from a small, from more of a smaller business standpoint. Uh, I usually try and keep it simple with some with certain small clients. I tell them, listen, don't spend more than you make. 
happens. <laughs> uh, and it seems like a very easy, simple concept, but a lot for a lot of business owners that I've worked with and talked to, um, they it, it just doesn't resonate initially until I basically spell it out for them. If you make a hundred dollars, okay, and you spend sixty, you have forty left. Don't spend fifty. That creates a problem. Uh, and sometimes you just have to put it in very plain, simple language for them to understand. Well, how could small business owners like? Let's say for let me just use a very practical example. I use. Um, QuickBooks Online, I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of folks are using QuickBooks or Quicken. You know, um, what reports should they be looking at regularly to make sure they're not spending more than they're making? Should they be looking at their cash flow statement or like where should you be looking? Yeah, so if you use any of these great software tools like um, QuickBooks, um, there's one that I used once upon a time, it was called Wave, I believe that's an online one, that was really good. Uh, a lot of them actually are pretty intuitive where I believe they actually will generate the, uh, the financial reports for you. Uh, there's mainly, there's three main financial reports, there's your balance sheet, your income statement, your cash flow statement. However, for companies on a, on a smaller scale, where maybe they're single employee, single owner, or maybe someone just selling stuff on Etsy, um, Something as simple as really monitoring your bank statement and making sure that you're looking at your, your bank statement on an ongoing basis. Uh, I always say I like to, um, since I come from the financial realm, I always evaluate my financials once a month uh, and I have a specified day on my calendar where I look at my books. Um, but also it's good to maybe once a week, once every other week, just to kind of take, uh, take a look at your operations account and see what's going in, what's coming out, um, any checks that are outstanding that haven't cleared yet. Uh, and look at also, what are, you, what are you spending money on? What are some of the expenses? And that's a good gauge to kind of really let you at least have an idea of what's going in and out of the account. Um, but one of the other things is that uh, ignorance is not an excuse where I, you know, I have some business owners say, well, I'm not a financial person or, numbers aren't my thing, or you know, I have an accountant for that. No, it is your responsibility as a business owner to know where you are financially. Even if you don't understand all the intricate details, you know, talk to your tax or your account, your tax advisor or your accountant or your CPA, whoever, but you should at least have a high level understanding of where your business stands fiscal. I can't have said it better myself. I'm going to share a confession with you, Walt. Mm -hmm. I had been in business for over 10 years at the time, long time. Uh, I went to QuickBooks online all that time. And I did not hire a bookkeeper. I had a CPA mm -hmm. to do the books, but I did not have a bookkeeper. And that was the wisest, smartest decision I made. She makes me reports. I tell her my goals. Mm -hmm. And she makes sure that I don't spend more than I make. And the mm -hmm. way she does that is, the way we did it, is she actually ha had me um, track my time, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm a publisher, right? Yep. So I don't have physical goods, mm -hmm. right? So she had me track my time on different activities like this chat. How long do you, does it take for you to prepare questions? How long does it take for you to do this? How long does it take to do that? And I kept track for about a month or so, 30, 60 days, right? So it has to be some relevant period mm -hmm. of data. And then she actually said, okay, if you want to get sponsors, you need to get a sponsor that's about X dollars. If you want to hire something out, don't pay more than X number of dollars per hour. And we review this all the time. And that has made a huge difference in my life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other advantage with a bookkeeper is that they will ask the question. So where you go and say, hey, you know, I saw this, I thought of this great idea, uh, you know, for um, maybe doing this marketing um, push for, you know, third quarter that I think would be great. Or if you come up with some other ideas, maybe kind of fly by night, they serve as that kind of check to say, mm, do we really need to do this? Or, you know what, right now, why don't we push this out till fourth quarter where based off of trends, you know, you start to generate a little more revenue than you do third quarter and we can better fund that initiative and fund it the right way. We're not, you know, we're not kind of doing it halfway. So it's always, it's always a great check. And another self check that, um, that I have even used myself, especially early on when I first started was 
every time I was going to go into another venture or purchase something or do some marketing efforts, you know, one of the things that I always ask is, um, what, what is the return on investment I'm going to get out of this and quantifiable? Can I, you know, can I quantify it? What is the amount of money that potentially this could result from, or is there an amount of money that could result from this? And if there isn't, then maybe it's something that I don't need to do. And if the return on investment is fairly small, then maybe it's just not worth my time right now. So let's ping back. Those are super useful. Let's ping back to talking about, um, let's say the red flags, we've ticked mm -hmm. off the red flags, but now there's problems everywhere. How do you go about finding a root problem? And I think this relates to almost the story that you told me earlier. Mm -hmm. How do you find the root problem? If you're on your own, right? You don't have a consultant yet. Right. So uh, what I like to talk, so what I like to say is, you know, I always try to get to what's what I call the, the core strategic problem. And often when I first meet with, um, with companies, whether it's CEO, COO, um, whoever, and I ask, and we begin talking and they'll say, okay, well, we're losing money. And I'll, and my response will be, okay, but that's not your problem. It's like, well, no, we're losing money. That's not your problem. That's a symptom of your problem, but that's not your problem. And so what I really try to do is to really, there's asking the right questions and really kind of diving in and trying to find out where the source is. And now if you're someone who owns a company and let's say, you know, you either haven't hired a consultant, um, can't afford to hire a consultant, or even just are trying to assess that there's an issue, uh, communication is probably the biggest thing you can start with. And by that means actually listening to your staff, talking with people on the front line. So people are actually doing the work, especially if you are having, you know, whether a number of employees where you're in a situation where you're more working on the business and not in the business, they're doing the work every day, you know, and that's where you want to start with talking with them and finding out what's causing delays or what some of the issues may be. If you're kind of a single owner person, it's, you know, you start with looking at, okay, how am I spending my time every day? Um, if it's a matter of, okay, you know, I'm just not getting as much client work as I was before, or my customers aren't coming back to me as often, what changed? What am I doing different? Has, has the economic dish conditions changed? Have consumer tastes changed? And so from that standpoint, it's going out and actually talking with the customers and asking them, um, how happy are you with the service I provide in the past? Is there anything you would ask me to change? Um, and really, so communication is probably the, the number one, but often it's overlooked as far as, you know, how to actually find the problem. That's fantastic. Well, I, I was taking notes over here. Um, now, let's talk about uh, like a lot of small business owners uh, probably never knew, at least when I look at my clients, they know they want to change, but they don't know where that change is coming from. Maybe they go looking to coaches or consultants. Mm -hmm. And now you've got me thinking that maybe they should be looking for a turnaround person, mm -hmm. right? So right. how long can it take to turn around a business? And the other question is, of course, the money question. Mm -hmm. How does it pay off? There's like three questions in there, right? Right. How do I, you right? I gotta, let's say, you know, you can't do it yourself. You got to find someone, mm -hmm. you know, what are the characteristics to look for when you find someone? Let's start there. What are the characteristics to look for when you are, uh, when you realize you can't do it alone? Cause I'm, I'm you would say most of them can't do it alone. I'm right. And so initially, you know, what, one of the things you want to look at, you want to talk to, uh, as you start talking and sold, definitely interview a few of them, talk to a couple of them. Uh, one of the things is you want to see, first off, are they listening to you? Are they receptive? Are they trying to basically pitch you and tell you exactly what they're going to do before they've really heard your problem? That's red flag number one. If you haven't barely explained the type of business you're in or the type of problem you're having, they're already giving you solutions. Okay, that's that's the first, that's first red flag. Uh, the second thing is you want to look at is what are some of their thoughts? Are they kind of, are they thinking somewhat outside of the box? Um, I know some people maybe feel more comfortable with someone who has direct 
experience in that particular industry, which is always great. But in other areas, you know, if they have more of a kind of a well-rounded background, if they have situation where, you know, they've done a number of turnaround uh, projects before, but also where they bring something to the initial meeting where they can offer some kind of initial advice or thoughts around it that maybe aren't your, let's say, typical uh, ideas. Just kind of give a quick example. I worked the client probably, I guess it's been about two years ago now, where I was actually there doing some financial analysis work uh, for the organization. They did um, human service and human services like family and social services. And so anyhow, I was sitting in a meeting with their chief of mental health and they were talking, they were losing roughly about half a million dollars a year in a, basically just uncollected receivables or money that they were owed, they just weren't getting. And uh, I was there really just to find out if they were projecting to lose another $500,000 the next year. That was pretty much all I wanted to know. But while I was in the meeting, they were talking. And so I started asking them questions and eventually asked them to explain the process beginning to end. Like I would like, explain to me like I'm two years old. And what we got to was by, you know, I'm summarizing, but basically by changing the day of the week that they submitted the form, we were able to recover the half million dollars for them. And sometimes it could be an easy fix like that where they just, you know, the, the, the people in the company, because they're so involved in the everyday and the operations that they're not really aware of how things can change or ways we can go with certain things. But, you know, you can bring certain things to life as a consultant and really look at other areas because it's like, hey, have you kind of thought about maybe doing it this way? And, you know, fortunately, we were able to, you know, recover that money for them. And now, granted, it's not always that easy. And a lot of times it's not. Um, turnarounds can really vary. But there are instances where they, uh, they can be a simple fix. How can a small business what are some, how do I say this? I think a lot of small business owners hate consultants and they hate consultants because the consultant's primary job is to keep selling you stuff and have you be completely and utterly dependent on that consultant. So what are some things a consultant might say that should raise some red flags? Like as you were saying, some, you know, you, you come to this meeting with a simple solution and that like totally solves the problem. And that I think would make the client feel good. Like, wow, you know, I could imagine someone coming in and saying, we have to do this and we have to do this mm -hmm. and it's going to take like two years and blah, blah, blah. So um, talk a little bit about that. The biggest thing a consultant has to do is justify their value. Um, that That's number one. And that's going to give the client ease. And you're right. And it's not just small or medium size. It's really companies of all sizes, you know, that I know that I've worked with who they hear consultant and almost immediately sometimes a wall goes up. And uh, even, even in the nonprofit sector, uh, one of my favorites, and it almost even turns to a game sometimes, is if I'm talking to someone in the nonprofit realm and they'll say, uh, and they'll say so what do you do? And I'll tell them I'm a, a management consultant. And, the, some, and look, I lie to you not, often the first response I get is, oh, we don't have any money. Like, I, I, I didn't ask you for any money yet. I don't even know if you have a problem that's worthy for me to solve. Uh, you know, we were just saying hello, but um, you know, but uh, yeah, that's, that's common for people here, consultants. And unfortunately it is because uh, there are so many consultants out there. There's so many coaches out there who unfortunately offer a lot of bad advice, very boilerplate or really just don't offer any kind of value. Or like you said, I really just want to, bill hours and try and keep you on the hook for as long as they can. Um, for myself and some of the other people that I've worked with, you know, my job is to really demonstrate value, to demonstrate why I'm coming in there and what I can do. So one of the things immediately that I try and do for the client is once they start telling me what some of their problem is, you know, I initially right off the bat, I'll try and offer, you know, some type of thought or, maybe solution to maybe the initial question of, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this option? Here's something else you may want to look at. And where my value add really comes in is not even ju not just the strategic portion of the coming up with the solution. Uh, I'm a certified project manager. So for me, it's also the execution because I can give you all the solutions and strategies in the world, however, but if they're not executed, carried out, 
to where it actually is beneficial, then it, it really doesn't serve a whole lot of purpose. Oh, so that sounds like something else to look for. It really helps to find someone who's really good at project management. So you don't want just someone to give you the report. You want someone who's able to come in and implement this thing. Absolutely. You want to make sure that they can do what they're saying they're, what they're, saying they're, they're doing. Because they can come up with the ideas, but can they actually execute it? Uh, and that you'll be able to tell usually right off the bat. And it'll save you a lot of time and money. So that's um that's something else you want to look at and also um it's never you know ask for referrals ask to speak with previous clients um, you know ask for case studies that's a big one if they can demonstrate a problem that they solved previously uh, whether in your particular industry or in another one you really would just want to you want to make sure that you know they are actually providing you with the value and, and like i say you know as a consultant that's that's where that's where I, 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 that's how I run my business. That's where I make my business is that I try and demonstrate the value that I bring and also exactly what, not just that I'm solving their problem, but how can we move forward? One, to make sure the problem doesn't occur again, because if it does, then I didn't do something right the first time. Uh, but also uh, the idea is how can we, you know, really advance your business and really push your company to that next level? You know, for me, I'm always, I, I consider myself a, a champion really for the underdog, for those small, mid-sized companies. I feel like they should have every right to compete in the industry as much as the, uh, as much as the, uh, the large Fortune 500 companies that are kind of entrenched in the industry. Like, I always go back to Dollar Shave Club, who, you know, tapped into a market dominated by Gillette, who owns, I believe, last I checked at one point, was 90% of the disposable razor market. Yeah, by finding some clever marketing uh, and really a niche and really a certain way of selling this product that wasn't really done before, uh, they were essentially able to go and punch the bully in the nose. And in five years, they were purchased for what? About, I believe a billion dollars by Unilever. So th there's always opportunity. How do you know? let's say you've gone through this process, you've hired a consultant, how do you know that the turnaround is working? So a uh, couple of different ways, uh, looking at, depending on what the, the project is and what we're turning around, if it's a matter of um, cutting back on costs or you know, if operation costs are doing very high, you know, managing, uh, basically monitoring the financials and looking at, okay, what were you spending previously on this particular activity? Uh, what are we spending now? Uh, ongoing discussions and meetings with some of the senior leadership. If it's a situation where it's more of like an employee productivity thing, then you're monitoring, uh, then it's staff management. It's doing, uh, whether it's employee engagement, employee polls, a number of different uh, tools you can use for that. So the biggest part of it with a company, if you've hired a consultant and are looking to turn around, is being actively involved. Um, the last thing you want to do is say, okay, I brought this consultant in, you fix it and let me know when it's done. That's, that's just not the most effective way. One, uh, the consultant will want you to be actively involved to really get your input since this is your company, you know the business, but also you want to make sure that they're staying on task and you know, that you're getting the full value for what you're looking for. So it's, for me, it's definitely a partnership. Um, I, I don't like engagements where it's more of the, the client saying, okay, you fix this and you just come back to me when it's done. Uh, this is an ongoing engagement also because as I'm fixing this or as I'm solving some of these problems, I want you to know how I did it and exactly the steps I went to went through to identify it and to be able to resolve it should you know, other problems come, come about. Now, if other opportunities come up and other projects with the organization, absolutely. I'd love to stay on and keep long-term clients, but I don't feel like any value is really gained by a consultant constantly just fixing the same problem over and over and over, or just staying on for this one issue that is just never getting resolved. Okay, so I got one more thing to mm -hmm. ask you. Uh, do a rant for me. So mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. Usually what I like to do is I like to have the, a snippet of the guest mm -hmm. saying something. Okay. And then I do the introduction, da, 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 right? So okay. do a rant for me. 
like meaning like, so we've talked about all this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, um, here's an example, like my typical rant in this particular space is mm. we in a manufacturing company, we have a process for freaking everything. There's even a process for like when you have lunch and when you go to the bathroom, but we have no process for getting and keeping customers. Like what's up with that? Okay. Like that's a rant. Like that's something right. I say to myself when I go into the, one of these situations, I'm mm -hmm. like, Oh my God. Right. You've got, right. ISO processes, for, for, I swear to God, some have processes for like going to the bathroom and right. how we got to ask permission. So mm -hmm. what, what's your rant when it comes to the space of small business owners who have a, so I'm going to be your director. Yeah. A small business owner, they got a struggling business. They could get help. They could. I would say the biggest, probably the biggest rant that the biggest rant that I had or the biggest issue is when companies will will talk to me, will look to bring me in, or and actually, you know, we begin the engagement and then completely discard anything that I tell them. And so talk to them. Talk to them. You're talking to those people. Yes. So one of the it's probably one of the more frustrating things when um, so you hired me as a consultant. And you're saying, you know, we, we're just having a lot of issues here. Um, attrition's really high. You know, we've had a lot of employees leaving over the last three months. Uh, revenues are down. We just cannot figure out the problem. Okay, so I come in. We start talking. I start doing some interviews with staff. I start looking at your financials, looking at your how you're servicing your customers, looking at talking with human resources. And then I come back with the strategy. Then I come back with, okay, here's some of the initial indicators of things that I found. And then you tell me that, no, we don't think that. No, that's probably not it. No, that's not it either. No, that, no, we're not going to go with that. Okay, so what, what am I doing here? Like exactly, wh exactly what am I doing here? Because you have, as Jerry Maguire once said, help me help you. <laughs> you know, and it happens more often than, um, than, than, than I could think. It, it, it happens fairly frequently. And I think a, a big part of it is just that they didn't think of it. And it's some, sometimes to them, it seems so simple, but maybe the steps to going to that aren't really simple. So uh, actually one of the things I'm kind of work that I'm working on now actually is um, I'm working on a, a course on a, a the site, uh, Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y, Udemy.com. And it's actually, I'm still in the stage of putting it together, but essentially it's going to be a, basically a consultant in a box course. And the idea is for companies who want to learn how to troubleshoot problems in their organization. And basically I'll be walking through the whole process that I utilize. So it's compiling information, organizing it, how to map it out, uh, analyze it, and ultimately to basically create the recommendation of how we solve the problem. So, but I think it will give a, it'll give a definitely a great understanding for companies of what is it consultants do or should be doing when they're trying to solve a problem, but also that appreciation to when they give a certain suggestion or they give a certain solution, even if you don't necessarily agree with it, to at least understand where the thought process came from and why, and why they, uh, they chose this course of action. Okay, so I'm gonna make you retell because I didn't record this, but I'm recording it now. I want you to retell the story of you're the problem. Remember? Oh, that, okay, okay, okay. That one. Go ahead. Oh, cool. so um, and a particular example I had was um, I met with a, a gentleman probably about two weeks ago. I met at a, a chamber of commerce event I went to, and. I was actually leaving out, it was a breakfast, I was leaving out and he comes up behind me and the first thing he says is, okay, so how can you fix my business? Well, my first question is, I don't even know who you are or what you do, so let's start with that. And what he told me was that uh, he was the uh, mortgage broker and recently opened a new branch office. And so from his initial assessment for what he said, again, the symptom was that uh, he was bringing, I believe about two million in, uh, two million mortgages a month, roughly, and thought he could be at 10 and felt like he just needed to get his people in front of more realtors and builders. So now when we actually sat down and talked, uh, turns out that 
it wasn't that simple. The problem was, was the people he had working for him, um, for all the birds were slackers. They were, um, you know, they were, they were very, as he put it, they were skilled in, um, in uh, basically in new mortgages for, uh, for new bills, things like that. Well, I'm sorry, in refinancing. And however, he said, just as rates have gone up, the mortgage industry has kind of changed. So now it's more about, uh, getting into looking at new bills and things like that just because people aren't refinancing as much. Well, they really weren't skilled as well in that and also in developing the new business. However, he knew this going in when he hired them. He mainly needed, as he put, bodies to get the uh, to get his shop open. And as he told me a few other factors, I had to have a very frank conversation with him and told him, say, you know what your problem is? The problem is you. Uh, you hired these people, you trained these people, you're putting them out there. It was strictly commissioned, so you're not paying them. What is their motivation for wanting to work for you? There, There is none. One guy said he even had a separate, had a full-time job. So now he's really not putting any work in on what you have him doing. So uh, so I, I mentioned to him, I, I gave him these suggestions, and he was kind of receptive at first. And then I sent him my, uh, I sent him a proposal, and I sent him a price quote. And then all of a sudden now he had these grand ideas of, oh, I think I can actually fix this and I'll just hire new people or, um, you know, our, uh, the, the mortgage company that he, that he worked for said, oh, actually, well, they have an internal recruiting thing, team that I can use that could bring in new people, which was the first I was hearing of this. So all of a sudden now this, uh, this is now a, uh, an option. And to me, that says that's, that's a flag in a sense of, if they were that great of an option, he would have already been using it. So, you know, so those are probably the ones that probably get to me the most where it's just like, you know, everyone loves what you do until they have to pay for it. <laughs> and now I want you to speak directly to a small business owner and say something like, uh, I think I want to ask you a question like, you know, what do you know for sure about struggling businesses? Like, is there hope? Is there not hope? Like if you were to like speak inspirationally mm -hmm. to a small business owner who's struggling, what would you say? If I speak to, speak to a small business owner who is struggling. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So how to you say how to basically, I guess you say inspire them or okay. Okay, um, so to to to, any, to a small to anyone running a small business or a small company, whether you have employees or not, who feel that they are struggling or things just aren't going the way you want them to, uh, there is you know there is hope. The the biggest the main advice I would give to you is one, um, is it definitely acknowledging that there is a problem. That's that's, it. that's the first step. Um, also, seek help. Seek help in the sense of finding out, getting someone, getting a trained professional, whatever that is, whether it's an consultant, whether it's an accountant, whether it's a legal issue, an attorney, uh, part of a being a business owner or running the company, whether it's one employee to thousands to Fortune 500 companies is, and also just being a great leader is understanding what you do not know and knowing that about yourself. And so it, it happens to a lot of us. For myself, it was a difficult thing that I had to learn too, you know, really uh, being honest with yourself and saying, you know what, I have a problem. And especially if you're the type who's the gutted out gritty type where I can fix this, I can push through it. Um, a lot of times you will waste valuable time just trying to push through it. And even if you do figure it out, the amount of lost time that could have been put towards, you know, fixing the problem and then ultimately growing the, uh, growing the company is lost. And so, you know, you have to look at it from a standpoint of look at your costs. And one of the common issues that small businesses and even large companies make is that they look at costs simply as the check they're writing or the money going out of the door. But you also have to look at your time, which is very valuable. And all of that is money. All that is time is time is money. All that is cost. All that is money that's not coming in. So if it's not coming in, it's definitely going out. So definitely, you know, don't give up hope. Uh, don't feel that you're out 
on your own, you're on the island. There are tons of great professionals out there whose their sole job is this type of work, is to help companies turn around, help companies get back on their feet and to not just uh, maintain, but to thrive. Awesome. I have so many things to choose from. I like that. And there you have it. Another edition of Bizapalooza Chat. Join us each and every Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern on Twitter, hashtag Bizapalooza Chat. Thanks for being here, everyone. Mm -hmm.